And how much do you have under management in total? We've got about $10 billion. Hedge funds are enormously powerful now in the financial system. There's a lot of them. Uh, they manage a great deal of money. Um, they're not regulated by and large. They're uh, usually in offshore jurisdictions where they are not regulated. I would uh, say that the top three trading institutions in the U.S. Treasury market, which is the largest securities market in the world, are in fact hedge funds. They're not banks. The only serious risk for a hedge fund is that if it consistently loses money, the backers will take their funds back. You can lose money. You're allowed to make a mistake once. But if it's a bad one, you're, uh, you're gone. I mean, it's a very fragile. I mean, you're, there is high return in that industry, yes, but uh, you could also very quickly lose the appetite for risk that clients have in you or the interest of clients. So, no, it's very, it's very severe. Very, you, nothing is taken for granted because you are the ultimate risk taker. And you here... Uh, manage how much money now? Now we have uh, around 4.2 billion dollars. Using funds from wealthy investors and huge amounts of borrowed cash, colossal fortunes have been accumulated by hedge fund managers. In 2006, an estimated 10 of them earned more than $500 million each, and five are thought to have trousered more than $900 million in that single year. They included George Soros, a consistent winner who famously made a killing when he sold the pound on a colossal scale and helped to force sterling out of the European exchange rate mechanism in 1992. The average person did not get much benefit from the boom, the super boom, in the last 20 years. Uh, the, it's really the uh, people like me uh, who have really uh, earned enormous amounts of, of money. Every soul will know it's me When they arrive at the pearly gate the spirit of an age can be captured in its art. So perhaps this is the symbol of all that debt-fueled financial excess. Damien Hurst's For the Love of God. The glittering death's head, encrusted with 8,601 diamonds, is said to have been sold to an investment consortium for 50 million pounds. But the details of its sale are shrouded in secrecy, as are so many of the transactions of the new super-rich. What's its intrinsic value? There's quite an argument about that. Who actually owns it? No one seems quite sure. In many ways, the glitter and the ambiguity seems to capture perfectly the spirit of this age of easy money. One reason why so much cash was pouring into the pockets of the stars of the new financial industries was the pay structure they devised. They wrote the rules of the greed game so they couldn't lose, though it turned out that most of us could. The money-making skills of private equity and hedge fund stars were considered so rare and precious that they were able to charge their backers astonishing fees. These new breed of fund managers were performing extremely well for their clients. So if you gave them a billion pounds, and if they turned it into two billion pounds, that's a billion pound profit, they'd take 20% of that as a success fee. The tradition had been to take half a percent a year of the backers' money for managing it. But private equity and hedge funds charge much more. A basic fee of 2% a year on all funds under management, plus 20% of all profits. This was jackpot capitalism. 
so long as that remuneration structure persists so it's a it's an asymmetric bet it's a one-way bet if he makes a great deal of money then uh, he gets his 20 percent plus of it um, and if he loses money well, it wasn't his uh, and i think once you've got that and that leads to earnings in some cases of literally hundreds of millions of dollars in the hands of individuals they're unlikely to change if you'd got a deal that you did for a billion sold for a billion and a half made half a billion you got a 20 percent carried interest on that a hundred million you'd probably have taken 30 or 40 million out of it in fees. The reason private equity charges what are considered to be high levels of fees is there are relatively few people in the private equity world and there are relatively few new entrants into that world. It's quite a rare combination of, of skills and the results, the financial results that uh, the industry is able to deliver to its investors means that the investors are continuing to pay those fees. Not only were the rewards massive, but the bet was one way. Using borrowed money meant taking 20% of the gains, but leaving all the losses for the original investor. And what began to motivate many wasn't pretty. Do you think greed got the better of some people in that period? Well, I don't know that it was greed. I think it might have been enthusiasm. Uh, and uh, I think in every cycle, it always works the same. People who are doing something keep doing more and more uh, of it. They lose uh, uh, a little of, of their grounding uh, in terms of the amount of risk uh, that they're taking. Because the rewards on offer from hedge funds and private equity firms were so huge, the big banks saw much of their talent defect to them. So the banks too had to offer their more financially creative employees the opportunity to pocket around 20% of the gains. Individual bankers now had the opportunity to play the greed game with their organization's money. It's particularly awe-inspiring when you get back to this central point that the, the main things which have driven people's ability to earn that remuneration, not every single case, but the majority of cases have been two things, a bull market and access to the bank's capital. It's not their own money they're risking. What's the sort of minimum, do you think, in the last two or three years that a fairly mediocre, middle-ranking trader or investment banker at one of the bigger houses would have expected to take home? Uh, you're probably talking about a million-dollar bonus in those circumstances. And how high does it go? Um, there isn't any limit. And as the greed game intensified, other professionals joined in. They were eager to facilitate the deals which would reward them rather than ask awkward questions about all that debt that was being heaped on the system. Everybody else joined in. The investment banks who were selling companies, uh, the accountants who were increasingly doing less and less work uh, to make deals happen quicker and easier, the lawyers who were finding their ways through difficulties, uh, by pretending they weren't there. Everybody contributed. It was a big bubble. And people made a lot of money out of doing as many deals and as big a deal as quickly as they could. If you were a Wall Street investment banker making $3 million a year, you were on top of the world. You were the master of the universe. Suddenly, that banker making $3 million is looking at the hedge fund guy who he used to work with making $3 billion dollars or maybe one billion dollars a year so it's created this big class warfare and envy between what I call the haves and the have mores many of the have mores feel a visceral desire to prove their superiority over the mere haves so there's quite an industry catering to their needs for those little extras meet Charlie who provides what they want however eccentric do people typically use you for stuff they want for themselves or as a present? Oh, it varies. One of the members for his little son asked for one of the premiership footballers to play with his son in his back garden. Which you were able to arrange that? We were able to arrange that. A specific that. premiership footballer? Yes. And you were able to arrange that? we were able to arrange that. It was beautiful. Are you looking more for brown or black? There's no price on it, which is plainly the sign of a good bag. What are you thinking of? That's eight and a half thousand pounds. I would have thought on my BBC salary that's more than affordable. We now have requests of submarines. No, really? Yeah, so they have their own submarines made. You can speak to someone and create your own submarine, which is uh, definitely unique and different. Yeah, unique and different. I, I think I'd probably find myself feeling a bit claustrophobic. Definitely. Couldn't someday, could you?
One of our members called last week um, asking for a, a jet fighter for her garden. Well, she wanted a jet fighter um, just, just in her garden, in her as, garden. As, as an ornament? Yes, that's all she wanted. <laughs> uh, why? I don't know why. We don't ask. We just say, of course, madam. We have to come up with more and more extraordinary experiences, whether it be living with a tribe in the Sahara for six weeks to challenge yourself and your mental state um, through to, uh, you know, climbing, climbing Everest. We have a Valentine's Day extreme event where you can have supper with your wife or your husband on an iceberg up in the Arctic. To walk onto boats that are, uh, and boats probably isn't a great description of them, vessels, that are larger than most homes that I've been into, that are 200 feet long, that can only go into limited ports because only so many ports can handle them, but to walk into staterooms that, frankly, you would think you were in the Palace of Versailles or Buckingham Palace or the White House, it is pretty amazing. And every time I walk onto one of these, these boats and have the opportunity to tour them, it continues to take my breath away. With such a boom in full swing by 2006, it looked like nothing could stand in the way of the players in the greed game. And yet the very methods they used to make all that money contained flaws that would topple them, derail the world's biggest economy, and cause mayhem for the banks on which we all depend. No interest rates didn't just make it cheap to borrow, they gave little incentive to save. And this had significant consequences for the banks, which needed to raise money to meet the inexhaustible appetite for loans. The first thing is that we had a significant decline in savings rates. So the deposits uh, fell. The banks could not necessarily provide all the funding for the products they, they, they got demand for simply from deposits. Uh, so they had to look for other forms of funding. And one of the forms of funding was to repackage some of the assets they have, sell them onto the market, get cash for that because they're transferring the assets away. And in this way, they have now more cash and they can start lending again. So in America, Wall Street banks started by selling good quality loans to raise money and then looked at what else could be sold. There was this machine that Wall Street created which was really remarkable. And they kept on pressing this technology to the point where um, they said, well, prime mortgages work. How about we expand this technology to include less credit worthy home buyers? With no income verification, no bank statements, and no tax returns needed. And with this no documentation loan, Greenlight Financial Services gives you the choice. Individuals, often those with the worst of credit histories, were given the opportunity to borrow to own that cherished home. They were known as subprime borrowers, and there were truly frantic attempts to lend to them. The ads would be, you know, literally, you know, just released from prison, never had a job, can't document that you, you know, are even a citizen. Please come down. We would like to make a mortgage for you. Uh, so they had to look for other forms of funding. And one of the forms of funding was to repackage some of the assets they have, sell them onto the market, get cash for that because they're transferring the assets away. And in this way, they have now more cash and they can start lending again. So in America, Wall Street banks started by selling good quality loans to raise money and then looked at what else could be sold. There was this machine that Wall Street created which was really remarkable. And they kept on pressing this technology to the point where um, they said, well, prime mortgages work. How about we expand this technology to include less credit worthy home buyers? With no income verification, no bank statements, and no tax returns needed. And with this no documentation loan, Greenlight Financial Services gives you the choice. Individuals, often those with the worst of credit histories, were given the opportunity to borrow to own that cherished home. 